Hello everybody, Mr. Wildcat. Hope you all having a wonderful day today. Today we are going to be looking at another Married Children review. The last time we reviewed Married Children, we wound up reviewing one of my favorite episodes from Season 10. Also, the first out of five guest host appearances on the Married Children podcast with uh, Dud Bowl 2, the Terry Bradshaw episode. Today we are revisiting another episode in Season 10 called The Two That Got Away, otherwise known as the Shannon Tweed episode. We haven't even started reviewing it. This is making me so hot. Oh. Well, let's try to keep our hands out of our pants, shall we? As we try to get through this episode. <laughs> it is the ninth episode from season 10, to be exact. Recorded on November 10th, 1995, and original air date, November 19th, 1995. Okay. So basically, this is an episode we start off with um, Al and Jefferson are planning to take a weekend lawn uh, fishing trip out to, let's see, I have it right here, Elk Head Lodge. It's somewhere out in the woods. Now, we don't know if this is up in the uh, forest up in Illinois or this is up in Wisconsin or even in Michigan, to be exact. Okay? We don't know exactly where this is. But before we head there, um, we are in the Bundy household. Al is pretending that he has an aunt and uncle who have both passed away. Aunt Betty and Uncle something else that wind up, um, passing away at the same time. And only he's going to go. Okay. And just as he's about to crash, about to bolt. Marcy and Jefferson pop in. Jefferson is all ge ge geared up in fishing gear. Okay. And apparently Jefferson took the different route. Instead of lying to Marcy about where he's going, he is actually honest with her for once and told Marcy that she was, he was actually going to be going fishing with Al. And Marcy was so pleased that Jefferson was being honest that Marcy rewarded Jefferson with a telegraph with a telephoto lens for his very fancy camera, which he plans on using on his fit on a fishing trip. Okay. And of course, you know what Marcy said. A lie will bring you temporary bliss, but honesty will make you feel better at the end of the day. Or something like that. So Al winds up confessing to, Mar uh, to Peg that he's actually gonna go fishing. And then Peggy already seems to know where this is going. But then we finally make our way out to the woods. Elk Head Lodge. Al and Jefferson are heading up to the front of the lodge with the singing of On Top of Old Smokey, All Covered with Snow. Na 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 na. Okay, I don't even know this song. I'm going to tell you one thing. Mary Children Podcast, they wind up showing a recording of this episode. They wind up showing a small clip of the original song that was made for this. God almighty, I wish I had never heard that. It is so fucking annoying. All right? After the first verse, like they wind up singing it in unison. When once you get to the next verse and so on and so on, you have like they they, they say the lyric and then they wind up singing it. Same thing, same thing. So annoying as hell. All right. But anyway, Alan Jefferson are gonna have a fun time. Or at least we think we're going to. Jefferson's starting to take pictures of random things around, and they haven't even checked into the lodge yet. Jefferson, will you stop taking pictures so we can enjoy this place? And then we have two attractive Swedish uh, ladies who wind up coming out of the, who wind up stepping outside the lodge to greet Alan Jefferson. Jefferson, will you start, will you start taking pictures so th we can enjoy this place? Gentlemen, we are your Swedish masseuses. I'm Inga and I'm Helga. And I'm Elga. <laughs> and I'm Gaga. And of course, I'm Kaka. <laughs> and I'm Elga. 
May we carry your bags? Why, sure. May we carry yours? Yeah, sure. Oh, Jefferson, we died and we went to the land of milk and honeys. Then we get a visit from Randolph, who is the innkeeper. And I'll talk more about him when we get to our trivia portion later on in the review. Uh, Mr. Bundy, Mr. Darcy, I'm Randolph the innkeeper, and I've been trying to get a hold of you. There's been a slight change in your cabin assignment. What change is it? You don't have one. Oh, that's okay. We can bunk in with Helga and Inga. Yeah, sure. Helga, Inga, you're late for topless happy hour. Yeah, sure. They say goodbye to Alan Jefferson before heading inside. And then, oh my God. Al, I mean, no, Jefferson winds up trying to straighten everything out. Pops out the reservation that was made. Shows the Randolph. Look, wait. You can't bump us. We made our reservation over a year ago. Oh, so you did. Let me explain something to you. You're nobodies, and you had a reservation. Shannon Tweed is a famous actress. She didn't have a reservation. Explanation over. Shannon Tweed? Start of Night Eyes 2, Night Eyes 3, and every fantasy that has is like a cable? And Jefferson brags about how Shannon Tweed got him through so many lonely nights of sex with Marcy. <laughs> and then we wind up getting a visit from Shannon Tweed herself. Walks out of the lodge in a bathrobe. Oh, Randolph! Are these the two guys who had reservations for my cabin? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I so wanted to meet them. So basically, Shannon wanted to meet the two guys who want, she wanted to get bumped from the cabin. And without even saying a word, she knows exactly. <laughs> she, she predicts that L is a shoe salesman and Jefferson is an unemployed, chronically aging gigolo. Okay? Now, of course, Jefferson takes offense to Shannon's uh, results. Um, based, Sh Shannon basically says, Oh, it's as I expected. A shoe salesman and a, a middle-aged, chronically aging male gigolo. Have him thrown out the property immediately. And then she walks off. Okay? Jefferson takes offense to Shannon's observation. Well, except for the fact that, especially the fact that he's an aging gigolo, and says, now Robert Refford, that is aging. So Randolph basically um, finishes off with Alan Jefferson. To show that he is not uh, completely heartless, he refunds back their deposit, and also gives them their complimentary mints. He suggests that Al has both of them. And they have approximately two minutes to get off the premises. The day. So basically, when I first saw when I first saw this episode and Randolph was giving both minutes to Al, I originally thought that Randolph had a personal thing against Jefferson. When I think it's actually more of an insult towards Al, because Al has a huge breath problem or something. Smells like shit, all right? And he wants Al to have that extra scent of breath, of fresh breath, okay? So Randolph gives him two minutes to evacuate, and he takes off. Al has a little bit of a problem. What the hell is his problem? He can't kick us off. Oh, Freddie can, Al. Private property. I'll show him some private property. Al winds up pulling down his pants and is taking a piss in the woods. Okay? He goes with walking down one side, peeing in the woods on the private property. Jefferson, on the other hand, he goes another route and he's starting to take pictures all throughout. Okay? So after they're done with their little charade, they wind up heading to the nudie bar for the rest of the weekend. Okay? Of course, no, they don't want to go home. They don't want to go back home with their wives. Instead, they're going to go crash at the nudie bar. 
for the remainder of the weekend. And while they're at the nudie bar, they drop off the film to a one-hour photo place to have their film developed while they're sitting there ogling women the rest of the weekend. Okay? So they get back, they crash in the Bundy living room, and they're going through the pictures from their uh, short time at the at the lodge. There's the lodge. There's the lake. There's the nudie bar. Wait a minute, Jefferson. We didn't take any pictures of the nudie bar. Well, they inadvertently took a picture of Shannon Tweed and Randolph naked in a hot tub together. <laughs> Jefferson, you know what this means? Yeah, Cosby's right. Kodak paper does make a difference. Not that, you idiot. It's payback time. Nobody bumps us, baby. Shannon Tweed's about to get bumped herself. Right under the front page of the National Enquirer. <laughs> okay. So then we go to commercial. All right. And then um, before we go into any further details regarding... Alan Jefferson's main plot. There's a small B plot line we should dig into. Okay? Because they're, it's going to coincide with each other towards the end. Okay? So basically, uh, the B plot is Bud winds up getting Lucky the Dog a acting gig for a dog food commercial. Hungry Puppy, to be exact. All right? Problem is, Lucky the Dog doesn't want to... He's not willing to learn any tricks with Bud, but once Kelly starts doing some tricks, he's willing to reconsider, okay? So then we get to the dog food rehe rehearsal. Apparently there had been over 2,000 dogs that had come past before Lucky's finally able to get up to addition. Uh, and when it's time for Lucky, he doesn't want to do anything. Bud asks, come on, Lucky. Don't you want to be in the dog food commercial and make some money? Yeah, I know how this works. I'm in the commercial. You get the money. I wind up sharing a jail cell with the cast of Different Strokes. <laughs> Kelly winds up, before uh, the director is able to pull the plug on this edition, Kelly decides um, that Lucky needs some encouragement. So she winds up running the course herself. Lucky follows quickly. And the director is impressed enough to basically say, Well, the edition's all over. We have our hungry puppy. Okay. So then um, we go back to the main storyline. Okay. Jefferson and Al, they had basically decided to get, um, they wound up inviting about, I counted nine people in the living room. Okay. These are guys from various uh, media outlets, especially the supermarket tabloids. National Enquirer. Now let's take a look. Why don't we take a quick look? Now let's take a look at some of the supermarket uh, tabloids. Okay, some of, so these are basically magazines you see at the reason why they call them tabloids. These are the magazines you see at the check stand of your local supermarket, okay? And this is pretty much the stuff, okay? And most of it's made up of random shit. Mostly not true, all right? But, of course, they put it in there because uh, just to get their attention, okay? So we have the National Enquirer. We have Daily Express. We have the Daily Record, which from Scotland, of course. Uh, we, have the we have the Globe. National Enquirer, National Examiner, News of the World. We have Star Magazine, Sun Magazine, Us Weekly, Weekly World News, and Women's World. These are pretty much um, just a few examples of supermarket tabloids, okay? Most of these you will find primarily in the United States. There's a couple that are out in, like, the UK, like England, Scotland, Ireland, okay? But basically, um, we're about to, Alan Jefferson are about to host an auction for the Shannon Tweed hot tub photo. Jefferson walks in the house. Attention, media whores. I mean, esteemed members of the press. The Shannon Tweed photo auction is about to commence. 
But first, Al has another photo he wants to auction off. He wants to auction off a picture. He claims that it's a Loch Ness monster. But in the truth, it's actually um, Peg's mother in the bathtub. Okay? And of course, you can't see the bathtub, but it's in there somewhere. This is at a time when uh, Peg's mother is still living with the Bundys. Okay? She lives there throughout the entire 10th season. So this is, this is another one of those continuity um, storylines that fits right into place. Okay? So one of the um, auctions, just one of the bidders, that's not the Loch Ness Monster. He's not that big. Another one says, so what? We put more, We put Roseanne's head on it and says she lost weight. I'll give you 50 bucks. Sold! Okay? Now... For the real deal, Shane and Chui, like you've never seen her before, they basically start to bid at 1000 Another one goes like 5000 And then we have another one that goes up to 10000 And $10,000 going once, $10,000 going twice. He's just about to pound that gavel to seal the deal when the doorbell rings. Okay? We wind up getting a... Okay, there's somebody at the door. So Al winds up going to go answer the door, and Jefferson is continuing the auction. Somebody has opened has extended the bidding to twelve five. Otherwise known as twelve thousand five hundred dollars. All right. Al goes to open the door and walks out on the porch. You're not gonna believe who it is. It's Shannon Tweed herself. All right. Now apparently it has gotten back to Shannon that a picture of her in a hot tub was taken and is up for bids by the tabloids. And she's trying to do anything she can to get it back. So she's there to apologize for the way she treated Ellen Jefferson at the cabin. And she's also trying to find a way to seduce him. Okay. So basically, she should be claims like she's ready to apologize. She's thought it over. When after she got back from the cabin, she wound up thinking it over with her shrink, her herbalist, the cannabinoid Starbucks, and they all say the same thing: "You gotta start giving again." Well, you actually gave it all in your uh, film, Indecent Exposure. Well, thank you, Al, but that was acting. This is real. I sure hope I've gotten to you in some way. And of course, he did. And he apparently has now. Al is carrying an envelope. Inside the envelope is the photo, the sh is the hot tub photo, as well as the negative that goes with it. All right. This was back in the day before digital photography. So basically, um, the film gets developed on a negative. Then they take those negatives and they want to printing pictures on photo paper. All right. Your choice, usually about. Three and a half by five, three by seven, somewhere in that range, or four by six. Most common for like little prints. You can also enlarge them to bigger sizes if you wish as well. Okay. But Al has basically uh, bought, he, he bought in on Shannon's bait and has decided to take the envelope, swallow the whole thing whole, which is very hard to do. Like, how in the hell he got that all down there in one thing is beyond me. All right? Al, what are you doing with that envelope? Did you swallow that whole thing? It looked like there was some kind of photograph in there. Yeah. Of me in a hot tub? Um, yeah. You, blue collar, brown panted. Shoe selling yokel. Despite what Cisco and Ebert say, I am quite an accomplished actress, as you so clearly demonstrated today. So the next time you want to see me in a hot tub, you rent my upcoming straight to video classic Ernest Pace for Sex. And don't forget to rewind. And after she's done having her way with Al, she turns away and storms off with a huge smile on her face. And if you freeze it, okay, 
She's got a big smile on her face, and the group hooters are really showing off. After Al finds out he's been had, he starts to spit, he starts to cough up the photo and negative to commence with it. At Jefferson then comes out of the house and tells Al that he's gotten him up to 25 grand. Al, I've gotten him up to 25,000. Now I say we make like Waterworld and close immediately. Oh, I'm choking. Why are you joking? I said I'm choking. So basically, he's supposed to give Al the Heimlich maneuver. The envelope with the photo and negative is supposed to come right out of his mouth. But no, Jefferson does the opposite. P gives him a huge pat in the back. The envelope. Okay, so the envelope and the ne the envelope with everything in it originally stuck in his throat. After Jefferson pats him in the back, it goes down, and that's the end of that. There, you feel better. So you're not choking anymore. No, but now you are. <laughs> so after Jefferson realizes what he has done, he winds up taking Al to the emergency room in an effort to get the negative out of them so they can finish up the sale. Unfortunately, Al's stomach acid dissolved everything. The envelope, the photograph, the negative, everything's gone. They also found three quarters of a commemorative sl uh, Slim Jim left over from Super Bowl twelve that was in there too. And now I'm saying, so that's what I've been teaching all these years. Okay. He decides to watch some TV to take his mind off everything. Okay. But then Bud and Kelly walk in. The Hungry Puppy commercial is about to come on. All right. So we won't get to watch the final product. Guess what? Even though Lucky won the edition, it's not Lucky in the commercial. It's Kelly dressed as a dog. All right. Hungry pup. I am crazy for puppy hungry. That's hungry puppy. Yeah, like what he said. <laughs> hungry puppy. Hungry puppy. Okay. <laughs> Kelly's sitting there with a big grin on her face. <laughs> Yay! While everybody else looks up at her in disgust. <laughs> Rightfully so. Now, apparently what it looks like, like is that when they went to go shoot the damn commercial, Lucky uh, wound up getting stage fright, and he, wanted, and he wound up doing away with the... He could not... He had a hard time um, following the obstacles while the camera was rolling. And, of course, he doesn't want to do anything without Kelly's assistance. So they basically fired Lucky and Kelly, who had a better shot at the obstacle course than the other 2,000-something dogs. Uh, she winds up taking over. And she takes over. She winds up taking over the whole commercial. Okay. So let's uh, go into some trivia. There's a lot to go to talk about here. So. The title of this episode is a reference to the idiom, uh, the idiom, the two that got away. I mean, the one that got away, which is typically used to express regret for breaking up with a person, only later realize how important or special that they were. Okay. Randolph the innkeeper is portrayed by Joey Segal, who is the brother of Katie Segal, the one who plays Peggy Bundy. He previously appeared on Married Children in the Season 6 episode, She's Having My Baby Part 2, as one of the bar patrons at the Paternity Ward Bar. Now, I never knew about, about this fact until I wound up listening to the Married Children podcast episode when it originally aired in January of 2022. Quite an interesting fact, might I add. Okay? So, Shay Marks, who plays Inga, she previously appeared on Married Children in the Season 9 episode, Pump Fiction, as one of the sexy women in Al's second film, A Day in the Life of a Shoe Salesman. And then we have Donna DeRico, who plays Helga. She was Playboy, Playboy's Playmate of the Month for September 1995. 
in her second credited acting role ever, with her first being on Unhappily Ever After, a show created by Mary Chill and co-creator Ron Levitt. Now, Unhappily Ever After wind up lasting on the WB for approximately, I think it was for about four years, from 1995 to 1999, lasting a total of 100 episodes. And it was, was very led to very negative reviews, so much to where it wound up getting voted by TV God in 2002 as the 30th worst show in the history of television. So what they did is they came out with a list of the 50 worst shows of all time. Unhappily Ever After was number 30. Those of you wondering what kind of shows were also on this list, well, well some of the films that might hit the top 10 were the Jerry Springer show, which was number one. Then you had My Mother the Car, that was number two. The XFL was number three. The original XFL, that was. Okay? Brady Bunch Variety Hour and Hogan's Heroes. Those were the top five on the list. But that's we have what we have other stuff to cover, so go check out that list if you wish to find out more. So this episode features three Playboy Playmates acting in the same scene, although only two appear on screen together at the same time. You have Donna DiRico, Playmate of the Month for September of 1995, Shay Marks, Playmate of the Month for May 1994, Shannon Tweed, Playmate of the Month for November 1981, as well as Playmate of the Year 1982. Okay. We'll talk a little bit, uh, yeah, we might as well talk about Shannon Tweed a little bit since we are here. So, so Shannon Tweed was born on March 10th, 1957 in New, F New F St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Canada. So she's a native Canadian. Okay. And at the time of this recording, she had just turned 66 years old. A Canadian actress and model, one of the most successful actresses of the mainstream erotica, she's identified with the genre of the erotic thriller cinema. Tweed appeared in more than 60 films and several television series and was named Playboy's Playmate of the Year in 1982. Also known for Gene Simmons' Family Jewels, a reality TV show that portrayed the life of her family from 2006 to 2012. She is married since 2011. She has been married to Gene Simmons, who was the bassist and co-lead singer of the band Kiss. Tweed and Simmons, they have two children together, Nicholas Adam Tweed Simmons and Sophie Alexandra Tweed Simmons. Okay. So she's the daughter of Donna. Uh, Donald Keith Tweed, a mink ranger, I mean, mink rancher, and Louise Tweed, who is raised on a mink ranch in Whitbourne. She was one of seven children, has three sisters, including actress Tracy Tweed. After Donald fell into a coma after a car crash, Louise uh, winded up moving her children to her mother's home in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and studied nursing with the family while the family survived on welfare. Shannon had breast enhancement surgery at the age of 20 and sequentially became involved in beauty pageants. Okay. She was a third runner-up in the Miss Ottawa event and won the Miss Canada Talent competition for her singing in 1978. Okay. So, let's see. She wound up appearing on Days of Our Lives in 1985. She's also appeared on episodes of Duke of Hazards and Mary Children. Um, also lent her voice to SpongeBob SquarePants in the episode 20,000 Patties Under the Sea. All right. So... I think that's all we're going to talk about her. All right. So, this is the third consecutive episode in Season 10 to feature a Playboy Playmate. The previous episode, Blonde and Blonder, featured Heidi Mark, 
who is Playboy Playmate of the Month for July 1995, while the episode before that, Flight of the Bumblebee, featured Noriah Davis, Playmate of the Month for March 1994. When Bud is trying to get Kelly to guess who his client is and hinted that they peed in the Darcy's Roses, she says, Dad? In several past episodes, it is mentioned that Al has urinated or defecated in the gardens of the Darcy's, as well as several other neighbors. He even boasted about how the Jenkins' Roses won a prize that year due to Al going to the bathroom in their garden on the episode A Man's Castle. This is the second appearance of the director, played by Leland Orser, who directs Kelly in a commercial. And I think he makes... And there's like three or four appearances throughout the show's run. His first appearance was in season nine's The Naked and the Naked and what else? Okay. What else did we appear in? I'll have to. It's the episode where they wind up uh, appearing on a Waste Away Shake commercial. So, let's see. The Naked and the Dead, but mostly the Naked. All right. So, that was his first appearance. And, okay. They wound up screwing that one up by basically putting, uh, using Kelly's body, but not her head in the after shot. And she also appears in this commercial for the dog food. Um, and he also appears later on in season 10 for Kiss of the Coffee Woman, another episode I plan on reviewing down the road. Okay. After Jefferson takes Shannon Tweet's insult about being an aging pretty boy personally, he says, Now, Redford, that's aging. It's in reference to actor Robert Redford who would have been about 59 years old when this episode originally aired. <clears throat> okay. So those of you wondering, okay, holy shit, he has gotten really old. As of today, he was born. He is 86 years old. Born August 18th, 1936. He'll be 87 in August. An American actor and filmmaker, recipient of various accolades. Accolade, uh, accolades, including an Academy Award from four nominations, a British Academy Film Award, two Golden Globes, the Cecile B. DeMille Award, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 2014, Time Magazine named him one of the most one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Okay. Now, Robert Redford wound up winning an Oscar for his director, for being the director in the 1980 film Ordinary People, which also wound up giving him, which also won Best Picture. Okay. He also appeared in a wide variety of other films, such as Barefoot in, in the Park, Inside Daisy Clover, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Jeremiah Johnson, The Sting, The Way We Were, All the President's Men. Okay. He also did directorship for Ordinary People, one of the most critically and publicly acclaimed films of the decade. And it gave him a. And I believe that one. I don't know if that gave him. It did not get, no, he just got the best director. He did not get the uh, best producer. There was somebody else. He also um, starred in 1985 Best Picture, Out of Africa, which was an enormous box office success and won seven Oscars, including Best Picture. He also directed the 1994 film Quiz Show, uh, which was about the television quiz show scandals of the late 1950s. Primarily 21. Okay. So that is um, Robert Redford in a nutshell. Okay. 
When looking at the photo featuring Randolph and Shannon Tweed in the hot tub, Jefferson grabs the picture and says, Cosby's right, Kodak paper does make a difference. This is in reference to photography company to the photography company Kodak and actor comedian Bill Cosby. Alright. So Kodak, alright. Now I believe this one is still around. Okay. But it's not in the same business as it was before. Okay. It's an American public company that produces various products related to the historic basis in analog photography. The company is headquartered in Rochester, New York, and is incorporated in New Jersey. It is best known for photographic film products, which it brought to a mass market for the first time. It was basically a partnership between George Eastman and Henry A. Strong to develop a film roll camera. After the release of the Kodak camera, Eastman Kodak was incorporated on May 23rd, 1892. Okay. So they wind up uh, struggling financially in the late 1990s as a direct uh, increase in competition from Fuji Film. The company also struggled with the transition from film to digital photography, although Kodak had first developed the first self contained digital camera. Attempts to di diversify its chemical operations had failed. And as a turnaround strategy in the 2000s, Kodak instead made an aggressive turn to digital photography and digital printing. These strategies failed to improve the company's finances, and in January 2012, Kodak filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy under the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York. Okay? They wound up emerging from bankruptcy in 2013, having shed its large legacy liabilities, restructured, and exited several businesses. Since emerging, Kodak has continued to provide commercial digital printing products and services, motion picture film, and still film, the last of which is distributed through its spin-off company, Kodak Alaris. Companies licensed the Kodak brand to several products produced by other companies, such as PixPro line of the digital cameras and manufactured by JK Imaging. Okay. And we're going to talk about Bill Cosby as well, okay? At the time, uh, he had served as the spokesman for Kodak and several other companies during the 1970s, reaching the peak of his spokesman career in the 1980s. So by the mid-1990s, he had appeared in less and less ads. The one set of commercials I do remember him doing in the early to mid-90s was for Jell-O and Jell-O pudding. All right, I definitely remember those particular um, commercials. And I know in the mid-1980s, right before my time, he wound up being the spokesman for New Coke. Coca-Cola attempted to change its formula in 1985, which um, even though it tasted good, okay, Talk about New Coke. It's the unofficial name of the reformulation of the soft drink Coca-Cola. Introduced by the Coca-Cola Company in April 85, it was renamed Coke 2 in 1990, discontinued in July of 2002. So basically, um, even though it uh, was supposed to have a good taste, a lot of people had whined about Coke changing their product. And uh, within a year of this new product coming out by 1986, Coke had changed its formula back to its original, calling it Coca-Cola Classics. And by that point, Pepsi had taken a huge lead in the Cola Wars of the 1980s. Okay? Bill Cosby and his fading spokesman career had previously been referenced in the Season 7 episode on Alpha Entry. We won't be mentioning much more about Bill Cosby because we have other stuff we have to go over. At the additions, the woman with the bulldog boasts that he has played Eddie on the NBC sitcom Frasier. Frasier uh, aired on NBC from 1993 to 2004. It is a spinoff of the classic NBC sitcom Cheers that aired from 1982 to 1993. Frasier, basically played by Kelsey Grammer, was a 
He wound up moving from Boston, which is where Cheers was set, out to Seattle, Washington, where he wound up doing a TV. Um, he wound up becoming a radio psychiatrist talk show host. Okay, One of the stars on the show was Edward Hibbert, who later appeared on Married Children as Dr. Rickaloo. Okay. He's the guy who is basically um, the love love conquers Al, where they're at the love retreat. Okay. Director also sarcastically asked if Lucky played Murray. I'm mad about you before Kelly tells him that Lucky hates Paul Reiser. Mad About You was an NBC sitcom that ran from 1992 to 1999, followed by a short series revival in 2019. Paul Reiser is an actor and comedian who is one of the main stars of the show. When Bud tries to encourage Lucky for the commercial, he quips, I get in the commercial, you get the money, I end up sharing a jail cell with the cast of Different Strokes. Different Strokes aired on a. It started off on NBC and then later went over to ABC and ran from 1978 to 1986. One of the stars of the show, Gary Coleman, had appeared on Married Children in How Green Was My Apple in, in Season 8, as well as the Season 10 finale of The Jokes on Now. As Lucky had alluded to, the three main cast stars, Todd Bridges, Dana Plato, and Gary Coleman, had all had some sort of legal trouble following the end of the series. Both Plato and Bridges went to jail on drug and criminal charges. Now, out of those three, Todd Bridges is the only one still alive. Dana Plato wound up committing suicide from a drug overdose in 1999, and about 10 years later, Gary Coleman wound up passing away himself. Okay. During the bidding for the photo, Jefferson complains that those press members had paid more for Brett Butler pulling out her wedgie. Brett Butler was an actress and comedian who at the time starred in the ABC sitcom Grace Under Fire, which also starred Mary Children guest star Jeff Pearson. All right. Let's see. Now, basically, Jeff Pearson had appeared on this, this season two episode just Mary Children as Rolling Squab the television repairman from Wisconsin, and the husband to Mona Squab. They both appear in the game show How Do I Love Thee, a game where two newlywed couples compete for physically torturing their partners for prizes along with Al and Peg, who are pretending to be Steve and Marcy. Okay? He also went on to play the lead role in the spin-off, in the WB show Unhappily Ever After. All right. So, one last piece of trivia. All right. And this is actually a goof. All right. After finding the pictures of Randolph and Shannon Tweed in the hot tub together, Al and Jefferson boast that they can sell it. In reality, they, along with whoever bought the photo, if Al had not swallowed it, would likely face some serious legal issues as Randolph had already asked them to leave the property before Jefferson took the pictures and that the pictures were taken on private property without Randolph's and Shannon's knowledge in an area where they likely expected reasonable privacy. All right. The last thing we're going to do is Super Bowl 12. All right. Probably wondering, okay, what is so significant about Super Bowl Twelve that basically got the Bundies? Like, why would they mention Super Bowl Twelve and the commemorative Slim Jim from that particular Super Bowl? All right. Now, the Mary Chung podcast team had been unsuccessful at figuring it out, and even I had a problem uh, problem looking for it. But basically. Let's go over a couple of a couple of fun trivia facts about Super Bowl Twelve to give you an idea of what we're talking about, shall we? So Super Bowl Twelve was played on January fifteenth, nineteen seventy-eight, 
featuring the NFC champion Dallas Cowboys and the AFC champion Denver Broncos, both of whom were appearing in their first ever Super Bowls. Um, I find that hard to believe. Hey, I find that hard to believe. All right. Yeah, that was bull. Yeah, that's bull. That's bullshit. <laughs> so they. Oh, okay. Dallas Cowboys and Denver Broncos. They were both number one seeds in the respective conference in the postseason. Okay, so that's where that is coming from. So basically, it was played at the New Orleans Superdome. I mean, the the Louisiana Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. First Super Bowl in a dome stadium, and the first one to be ever played in prime time in the Eastern United States. Okay, so basically, it was a game between quarter, Dallas quarterback Roger Staubach, who had been mentioned in double two by Terry Bradshaw. I call my own plays. That was Staubach. I beat him in the Super Bowl twice, and then against. Um, Craig Morton, who is quarterback for the Broncos, he apparently had been a quarterback for the Cowboys, all right, who eventually wound up with the Broncos, okay? Uh, let's see, this was Dallas's fourth Super Bowl, and he basically um, also had the doomsday def defense. They wound up dominating the Chicago Bears and the Minnesota Vikings to the Super Bowl, all right? So, let's see. Um, anything else we... The halftime show that year, like Super Bowl, the halftime shows was completely different back then. Basically, the, the pre-game festivities featured Southern University marching band, along with cheerleaders for both teams, Phyllis Kelly of the Northeast Louisiana University sang the national anthem. Uh, halftime show was From Paris to Paris of America, featuring performances by the Apache Band and Apache Bells Drill team from Tyler Junior College, clarinist Pete Fountain, and trumpeter Al Hurt. All right. Yeah, it's come a long way. All right. I don't really know what else... We could think about like why they would pick that unless it was completely at random. Okay. Now we're right out of time, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you my review for this episode. The two that got away was a very good episode. They basically did Shannon Tweed very well. They played her very well, and they uh, she was such a and she seemed to be a good, such a good sport. Might I add? Okay. And um, it's an episode that I always want to come back to on a regular basis, okay? This is definitely an episode, like, whenever I go back to season 10, this is one of those episodes that I am racing back to watch again and again and again. That's how much I loved it. And even though I wasn't much of a fan of the B-plot Hungry Puppy, there wasn't much of it in there to, for it to get in the way. But, okay... And of course, Al, thinking we're, that he's finally going to get rich, he uh, based the Bundy curse comes back into play when he winds up swallowing that negative. Okay, my favorite um, line, my favorite parts of this episode: the Swedish masseuses, Inga and Helga, and I'm Alga. <laughs> and then we also had Randolph, who came in. We also, um, I also love the Shannon um, telling off Al towards the end. You, you, you. So the next time you want to see me in a hot tub, you read my upcoming straight-to-video classic, Ernest Pace for Sex. And don't forget to rewind. <laughs> so that was the one I really loved the most. Okay. Overall, I loved it. So, I loved it. Loved it so much. The two that got away, it's going to get a five out of five. Okay. That's how much I loved it, okay? That is all the time we have for today. If um, there's another episode, I will be back down the road for another Married Children Review. If there's a specific episode you would like me to review, please leave your suggestions in the comment section below. Until the next time we meet, Mr. Wildcat, 
is not going to be good, be careful, and behave. He's not going to be behaving. But instead, the next time you want to see me in a hot tub, you rent my upcoming straight to YouTube classic, Ernest Pace for Sex. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And until next time, Mr. Wildcat, reminding you to be good, be careful, and behave. <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.